top stories tonight. Defense headquarters condemns call for military coup. President Bola Tinubu resumes duties after working vacation. Dangote Refinery 6 court order to void import licenses of NNPCL, others in 100 billion naira case. Cameroonian leader Paul Bia returns to Yaoundé after weeks abroad. Good to have you join us. Thank you. I'm Felicity Ezewike. Our coverage tonight begins in Nigeria's capital, Abuja, where the defense headquarters has condemned the call for a military coup, describing it as a treasonable offense under the law. The warning came in a statement signed by the Director of Defense Information, Brigadier General Tukul Busau, on Monday after a viral video where some persons were calling for a military takeover surfaced online. It also clarified that there was never an appointment of an acting chief of army staff to replace Tauri Dulagwaja. It explained that the chief of army staff is currently on a well-deserved rest as part of his 2024 annual leave. The statement said Major General Abdusalam Bagudu Ibrahim, the chief of policy and plans, is providing routine briefs to the COAS in accordance with standard military procedures. Let's head on to the court where we understand that the Dangote refinery, petroleum refinery and petrochemicals has filed a lawsuit at the Federal High Court in Abuja, presided over by Justice Ian Gepo, seeking to void import licenses issued to the Nigeria Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority for petroleum products including automotive gas oil and jet fuel. The suit claims that the licenses were improperly granted to the Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation Limited, Matrix Petroleum Services Limited, and others, despite Dangote's production exceeding Nigeria's daily consumption needs. The refinery also is seeking 100 billion naira in damages from the NMDPR. A, the court has directed all parties to respond to the claims with a future hearing scheduled to address the issues raised and determine the validity of the import licenses. Plaintiff's lawyers, George Ibrahim S.A.N., praised the court for an adjournment to enable parties explore settlement options. Justice Ian Gekwo adjourned further proceedings till January 20, 2025. Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Yesong Wike, has flagged off the construction of 40 housing units for judicial officers in Abuja. The minister, during the ceremony, assured the judiciary that the units will be completed in 15 months, saying funds have already been made available. We have flagged it up. But how are you sure that they will give us the C of O? We are going to give the CEO for here to the Court of Appeal, to the Federal High Court, and to the FCT High Court, so that they know that as we are viewing your land, and by next year, God willing, by the grace of God, and the contractors should know we have mobilized you, we mobilize you under the rain, you must also work under the rain. No excuses of the rain was too much, the sun, no. Work as we have paid, nothing like rain or sun. We are not going to hold the contract up at all, at all. We'll make sure that this is a parallel project that will be completed on time. And my Lord, the Chief Justice, will also be here next year by the grace of God to come and commission it. And we also believe the Court of Division, which was flagged up by a predecessor, will also be commissioned by next year to the glory of uh, God. My Lord, you're a very lucky person. God's time is the, is the best. And it's how it leads that the will of God that it is at this time you will be the Chief Justice of uh, Nigeria when such project is starting. It is not anybody's own making. It is how God has weighed it. So we'll like say once more, congratulations. And we are happy that you are the one flagging it up and you'll be the one that will commission it. It's been four years since the NSAS protest, a nationwide movement that rocked Nigeria and brought global attention to police brutality in the country. 
In October 2020, thousands of young Nigerians took to the streets, demanding the disbandment of the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, or SARS, a unit of the Nigerian police notorious for harassment, extortion, and extrajudicial killings. Our correspondent, Benada Kede, looks back on the key events that have unfolded over the last four years and the current state of justice for the victims of that movement. It started as a peaceful protest with demonstrators carrying placards and chanting slogans like End SARS and We Want Justice. The movement quickly gained momentum with protests in major cities across Nigeria. The youth-led protests were fueled by years of anger and frustration over police brutality and impunity. But what began as peaceful demonstrations ended tragically at Lekki Tollgate on October 20, 2020, when security forces allegedly opened fire on unarmed protesters. The judicial panel set up in various states were a good first step, but four years later, many victims and their families are still waiting for compensation and very few police officers have been prosecuted. Many believe the slow pace of justice is disheartening and it sends the wrong message about accountability. The Nigerian government did eventually disband SARS, but activists say the reforms that followed have not addressed the deeper issues within the police force. Is that when you are talking about the police institution today, you are not talking about an independent body that is out there to preserve the rights and dignity of Nigerian citizens. That is what is there on paper or in the constitution. When the real sense of the world, the police and the army are simply instruments of class oppression and class coercion. It is not difficult to understand the meaning of that statement that you had clear instructions and where those clear instructions would have come from. But don't forget that the massacre four years ago at Lekki Gate was also a product of clear instructions by certain people in power, especially those who had business interests at the Lekki Gate. For many Nigerians, police brutality remains a daily reality. Speaking on News Central's breakfast show, one of the protesters who was taken into custody on the fourth anniversary of NSAS shares her experience. Commissioner Wito went to meet the police. Um, I think he went to meet uh, one of the policemen to explain our reasons for being there. The next, before we know what was happening, police were already beating us. They were beating us, like, move it, move it, eh? move it. Okay, we started moving. And that was how they moved us to their Black Maria. We are not criminals. That is the way you handle criminals. We were just protesters that were out yesterday to lay wreath, to commemorate the date that the massacre that happened there four years back. But we were brutalized and beaten by the police. In 2021, the Lagos State Governor called on the youth members of the Diplomatic Corps civil society groups, students, and the media to join him on the peace walk. He said it will signal a new beginning towards the rebuilding of the state. Songolu specifically invited Faus, Debo Adeboye, popularly known as Mr. Macaroni, Dele Farutimi, an activist and lawyer, Shewun Kuti, amongst others. His invitation was declined, with Shewun Kuti saying there cannot be peace without justice. Over the past four years, judicial panels were set up in various states to investigate cases of police misconduct and several victims have been compensated. But many relatives of those who lost their lives, especially at the Lekki Gate, have chosen not to speak to the media, citing fears for their safety. As the country reflects on the events of October 2020, the fight for justice continues. While some progress has been made, Activists and victims say that true justice and reforms are still a long way off. In Lagos for News Central, I'm Bernard Akede. President Bola Tinubu has resumed official duties at the Asarok Presidential Villa in Abuja following his return from a two-week working vacation in the United Kingdom and France. Photos released on Monday from the State House show the president receiving a briefing from the chairman of the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Mr. Zak Adedeji. Tinubu returned to Abuja on Saturday after departing the capital on October 2. According to a statement by the Advisor on Information and Strategy, Bayan Onuga, the president traveled to Paris on October 11 for an important engagement as disclosed by his senior special assistant on political matters, Ibrahim Masari. The president's return comes as concerns grow over the delay in the presentation 
of the 2025 appropriation bill. The Nigerian Drug Law Enforcement Agency has condemned the recent remarks by lawmaker Oyelola Ashiru, accusing the Member of Parliament of a direct attack on the agency's reputation. Spokesman of the agency made this known in Abuja during a press briefing, accusing the lawmaker of exercising a personal vendetta against the agency. New Centro's Joshua Marie has more in this report. The statement by the lawmaker was made during the bill to establish the National Institute for Drug Awareness and Rehabilitation at the Senate in Abuja. NDNA had become so compromised, so ineffective to the extenders, leaving drug enforcement or drug education. So NDNA will never get where we are going to. The statement elicited reactions and nationwide controversy as the Nigerian Drug Law Enforcement Agency refused to let it sleep. For a member of the upper chamber to have made such an unfunded and unwarranted categorical statement against the agency led us to look inward to see what could have been responsible for such a capital general statement. What we found out was shocking and we concluded that his statement came from a place of vendetta are certainly not out of public interest or any altruistic motive. The NDLEA claims that Senator Ashuru's statement was driven by a personal vendetta against the agency following a raid on his residence over suspected use of illicit drugs by its occupant. Based on credible intelligence and surveillance which confirmed that the senator's house was being used as a drug joint for drug dealers and users. The house was raided by our operatives at 1.30 p.m. on February 4, 2024, during which the two aides were arrested while a third suspect escaped arrest. In another encounter with the senator, the agency also received intelligence that some of his boys, popularly known as Homo Senator, operating from his hometown of Bar, were equally dealing in illicit drugs. The NDLE has stated it will not be deterred by any attempt to tarnish its image and remains committed to its mission. The agency reaffirmed its determination to dismantle all illicit drug networks across Nigeria, regardless of the status or reputation of those involved. In Abuja for New Central, I am Joshua Imarai. Let's now see if we can reconnect with a human rights lawyer an activist, Inibehe Efiong. Inibehe, thank you for joining us. Let's just confirm your audio once again. I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. All right. Um, yesterday, we saw some level of disrespect by the Nigerian police to innocent protesters. Um, would you say it's a reflection of what has continued in the past four years, despite uh, the brutality that was seen? and the pledges of reform since the MSAS protest? Well, so far, uh, it is obvious to Nigerians that uh, this government has no interest whatsoever in reforming the police. Uh, Nigerians are still being killed on a daily basis. The injustice that citizens complained about, the judicial killing, the extortion, and the wanton abuse of the police by politicians and even non-state actors. None of that has changed in any material respect. Uh, rather, what we have seen, uh, in some sense, the, it seems the situation has even gotten worse. So the government itself has not demonstrated capacity or the honesty or integrity to reform the police. If you look at the demands of the protesters in 2020, including the one for the funding of the police and increase in the salary of, well, of, of police officers, nothing drastic or fundamental has been done in that regard. We, the, protesters are also, the protesters have also demanded that the members of the disbanded special anti robbery squads should be subjected to psychiatric tests before they are allowed to be uh, regrouped or to be admitted into other departments of the police. That was also not done. Of course, the government set up the judicial commissions of inquiry across the states. That was done by governors of various states. But guess what? The reports of those panels of inquiry have not been implemented. 
except for Lagos where a marginal aspect of the reports relating to payment of compensation was paid to some persons. But in most of the other states of the federation, nothing was done. So all this goes to show that the government is not serious. The government has no interest in reforming the police. And the reason for that is simple, because the politicians need the police to rig elections. They need the police to harass their opponents. They need, they need the police to remain the way it is for them to continue to use it as an instrument, instrument of oppression. That is my explanation on why the Nigeria police has not been reformed. I believe it is intentional. I believe it is deliberate. I believe that it is calculated to continue to keep Nigeria subjugated. The relationship between the police and Nigerians have not improved. To date, Nigerians still treat the police with suspicion, while the police continue to treat Nigerians with, with hatred. This cannot continue. This cannot continue to be the case. So therefore, something has to be done to ensure that the situation changes. But I'm not very optimistic that something is going to change anytime soon. I mean, uh, you, you, it's almost like you're saying two different things. Something has to be done and you're not optimistic. What would be the right scenario for optimism uh, that something can be done? Because my colleague in that report mentioned that some of the victims, four years on, are still afraid to speak, worried for their safety. But there were key recommendations from all the panels that were put together and from you know, lawyers like yourself. So what are the scenarios that will engender change that will make you a little more optimistic that the police can change? No, the police is not going to change anytime soon. I think that is the reality we, we all have to accept. Expecting the police to change is just... Uh, uh, being, uh, I, I don't want to call it delusional, but the reality is... No, 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 no. What, what I'm asking is, what can be the reforms that can happen, you know, if in an ideal scenario, because we can't continue to say nothing can happen. We have to move forward as a society. Well, the laws are there. The laws have been put in place. We have the Police Act of 2020. We have the Anti-Torture Act of 2017. We have the Administration of Criminal Justice Act of 2015. We have a couple of you know legislations that have been put in place in recent times. None of these legislations have been have been implemented. So if I tell you that oh we need to pass laws, we already have laws. The problem is not laws. There are, in fact, if you look at the new police act of 2020, it was actually designed with the primary objective being respect for the rights of Nigerians. But what has changed? So that is why I'm saying that this is not about putting laws in place. I, and I say that very seriously as a lawyer. It is not about law. The laws today are designed to protect Nigerians, including the police act, which has outlawed the arrest, arrest in proxy, and was also outlawed by the ACJ. It has also outlawed arresting people uh, for civil matters. So none of these have been implemented. So it is not a legislative problem. This is clear lack of political will. So when you ask me what, what can be done, what can change, what we need is political leadership, the political will to reform the police. And I have explained to you that those that have the power, those that have the capacity, those have, that have the conditional authority to effect changes, they are very comfortable with the police being the way it is. Because the police currently, as far as they are concerned, is achieving the, the agenda for which they have designed it for. Anyway, right? So what... if you want to reform the police to be a law enforcement agency, you will be assuming that those that have the capacity to effect that change want, want Nigeria to be a law-abiding country, and that is not what they want. In, in the last four years, we've had pockets of uh, protests and violence, and we also had some major ones along the lines, where even some persons died in the process. Um, what are the implications long term if we do not address not just the, the issue of police brutality, but some of the challenges that are bringing back this protest, you know, in, in, in batches in the past year? <laughs> People will resort to self-help. We are ready there. I, I, I believe those of you in the media, you would have followed recent increase in the extrajudicial killing and uh, citizens basically taking jungle justice, to taking laws into their hands. Indeed, even the IG of police, I think two days ago, came out to condemn the spread of uh, jungle justice in the country. So people have lost faith in the police. When people cannot trust the police, that, in, that harm done to them will be redressed. When Nigerians cannot trust the police to investigate crimes, when Nigerians cannot trust the police to act professionally or to respect human rights, they will begin to take laws into their hands. And that is exactly where, where, where we are. The reason why non-state actors 
have become so emboldened in the southeast, in the northeast, and the north central, and other parts of the country. It's partly because our law enforcement institutions have basically failed to discharge the responsibility imposed on them by law. So Nigerians are now beginning to look for extrajudicial means or extra legal means to address their, their problems since people don't really have a lot of trust in the police. The police, to, large, to a large extent, has been weaponized. That is why we must continue to fight and insist on reform. That is why we must continue to expose policemen and police officers and people in political positions who have bastardized the police institution and ensure that we find a way to ensure that things do not just remain the same. So I'm, I'm not just simply telling you that nothing can change. Of course, something can change if okay. Nigerians continue to demand changes. And that is why when people are protesting, we have a responsibility to protect them. We have a responsibility to defend them because it is only through the, you know, citizens expressing their disaffection with government through protests and other democratic mode of civic engagement that those who claim to be leaders in our country will even pretend to listen to what they are saying. Yeah, I, anyway, I, I do get the point. I think at the heart of your submission today is we need the political will. It's not a lack of law or um, a lack of, you know, guidance that is required. Thank you for speaking with us. We appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has rejected a request from the People's Democratic Party, PDP, in Ondo, to remove Toyi Babalola, the state's resident electoral commissioner, REC, ahead of the November 16 governorship election. The PDP argued that Babalola, who has lived in Ondo for over 30 years, is too connected to the state to remain impartial. Despite their concern, INEC spokesperson, Rotimi Moyekomi, stated that there is no evidence of unethical behavior to warrant her re redeployment. He emphasized that Annex decision on rec postings are based on policy and that Babalola will stay in her role. Annex says it is committed to ensuring a free and fair election in Ondo State. Long queues have resurfaced at filling stations across Nigeria's capital, Abuja, as motorists struggle to purchase petrol. The queues resurfaced on Monday morning, causing serious traffic, with motorists spending hours without being able to purchase the product. My colleague, Emmanuel Bagudu, tells us more in this report. The immediate cause of these petrol queues remain unexplained to motorists and residents alike, as they remain shocked, saying that they don't expect this hardship to continue, especially after the ease in the pump price of petrol. It's very, very difficult to, you know, easy for we inside Abuja here, what we did, to get fuel. The fuel now, NMPC is selling it to 1,013 euro. Yes, people think that it's cheaper. Yes, for me, it's day cheap because I don't go to that free station. They sell 1,200, 1,150, 1,180. Yes, but it's an NPC to get the fuel is difficult. Now, if you don't have, if you don't buy up to 18,000 naira, 18,000 naira fuel, you will not be able to work in a day. And that 18,000 naira fuel is not up to 20 liter. You know, one liter is more than 1,000 naira now. Please and please, we and please, government should come out and go around and see what people are facing. Honestly, it's not funny. I've been on this queue for over three hours. This fuel was increased, and we thought increasing the fuel will help us the masses. But now you can see, buying fuel at about 1,000 plus, we still queue for about three hours. So what are we enjoying in this country? It's funny. So even today, I enter a filling station, I don't pass three hours for queue. So some people they see The way I enter around uh, at nine thirty, up to now, I don't I don't buy for it. The availability of the product is obviously scarce, as most fuel stations were seen under lock and key. The motorist lament how this is affecting their livelihoods. I'm mean, a taxi driver, and my car is this. Now they use actually don't make the car. Now delivery now they do, and they bring return. So just imagine say a day line for like five to six hours. Before I get full, I will go take a walk, still bring money for the owner of the car. So tell me, what time I get to walk the walk? For me spending three hours here, has it not affected my business? It has affected it. 
Even if I'm not doing anything as at that time, I need to be somewhere relaxing. It's been two weeks since the pump price of petrol have increased to over a thousand naira, and the queue still persists, making it difficult for motorists to assess the product. It is anticipated that the cries made by these motorists will be heard and will be attended to. In Abuja, for New Central, I am Emmanuel Bagudu. In recent times, there have been rising cases of assault and physical abuses on teachers and school staff in schools across the country by both parents and students alike. Reasons for this have largely been attributed to a rise in stress levels on both teachers and parents, especially given the harsh economic realities leading to a harsh and irrational reaction to circumstances which most times end up with very negative results. News of one of such physical assaults on the staff of Rosebud Schools, Lagos, had New Central's special correspondent on investigative journalism, Marshall Anthony Ononyi, taking a dive at the matter to investigate the root cause. His report. <laughs> This is a video showing a man identified as Mr. Ayofe assaulting a female staff at Rosebud Secondary School in Idimu Axis of Lagos State. After receiving this video from a familiar source calling for the matter to be investigated, I moved to the location to find out the story behind this action. Upon arrival at the school, I faced the usual resistance initially from the school management who did not want media attention on the matter. However, after several push from my end, the school caved in and granted audience. In the afternoon, he came and said he wanted to pick his kids. So he bashed him and pushed the lady that was at the door, the teacher on duty that was at the door, pushed her off. She tripped and went all the way upstairs, straight to the teacher's class. So Miss Elizabeth was like shocked, like, your son is downstairs, sir. School is over, so definitely he's downstairs. And then he said, no, I want my son, provide my son, produce my son. You know, he kept saying all that. So we rushed him, rushing in, I'm like, in fact, you must have seen the video. The HM just rushed in, she was shocked, I was shocked. You know, and I was like, what's going on? And then she just tried to separate the fight. What's going on? That's when we saw that he was beating the sanitation officer. The sanitation officer was in my class trying to sweep. Then she said, Ma, Essa, she has told you that your son is downstairs. Please check him downstairs. So before you could know, he just walked up to her, pushed the tables, which she has already pushed away to start sweeping pushed it and went to her straight and started beating her up. I just picked my phone, I was recording, videoing what was going on. Lo and behold, he came to me again. In the video, if you can see, there was a kind of wavy movement there. That was when he came to still hit me as I was recording. We were initially told that the person who was assaulted in the video was at the hospital for medical treatment. However, before I was done with my interviews, the assaulted staff, Paul Agnes, walked in. So the man ran to, uh, upstairs, was shouting and shouting. He said, where's my son? Where's my son? The teacher said, your son is downstairs. He was angrily shouting again and again. And I have to stand up that the teacher said, your son is downstairs. That's how the man started beating me and blowing me, collecting broom from my hand and be eating me, beating me near before the HM come and separate the fight. Mrs. Kenny is a parent at the school whose child is also under the tutelage of Mrs. Ogri. I think the wife quickly, because she's a police, so she went ahead to call the police people so that they, they, they all came. Before you look at it, they said they were going there. When I went to the station, the way the wife and the, uh, the husband was, they insist that they should lock up the teacher. Meanwhile, they are the one at fault. Because she's a police, she wants to use the, uh, the hands that, okay, she's a police, so they can do something. We were told that you were detained at the station. It was very traumatizing. Very, very. I wouldn't have believed in my whole life that I would, in in even, even a second, standing in the police station, station, not even the cell now, in the station, not to talk of having a night of sleep in the cell. From all the narratives, it was necessary to stop over at the Idimu Police Command. 
I arrived Area M Command Idumu and met with the commander, ACP Olainka, who admitted to me off camera though that he did not know of the case but promised to look into the matter, which he said must have been reported at the Dimu Police Division. After leaving Area M Police Command, I tried to locate Mr. Ayofer, whom I gathered lived within the neighborhood. Excuse. At the address, which I had, I met no one at the compound. Back at the office, I also made several attempts to reach out to him on phone. My calls went unanswered and not returned as at time of filing this report. There is every indication that in the coming days there will be more to hear on this matter as calls go out for the prosecution of Mr. Ayofe. For News Central, Marshal Anthony Onoye. The news continues in Central Africa. The Cameroonian president, Paul Beer, has returned to the capital, Yaoundé, after weeks abroad, dispelling rumors about his health. The 91-year-old leader was seen arriving at the international airport alongside his wife as a jubilant crowd gathered to welcome him. Supporters dressed in outfits adorned with his portrait sang and chanted to the beat of the drums while the while lining the streets as his motorcade swiftly departed the airport for the presidential palace. Large posters welcoming the long-serving president were also visible throughout the city. Beer's absence from the public eye following his departure from Beijing in early September after the China-Africa summit had fueled speculation about his health. Up next is business news. Business news in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. In business, the federal government of Nigeria has announced plans to increase oil production by 1 million barrels per day within the next 12 to 24 months. This was revealed by Gbenga Komolafe, the chief executive officer of the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, NUPRC, during the commission's third anniversary celebration. Similarly, he further revealed that the government has approved Seplat Energy's $1.28 billion acquisition of ExxonMobil's onshore assets. The acquisition grants Seplat Energy a 40% interest in four oil mining leases, the Kwa Ibo Export Terminal, and a 51% stake in the Bonny River Natural Gas Liquid Recovery Plant. And still in Nigeria, the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Gas Marketing Limited and A4E Energy have partnered to build a 100 million standard cubic feet per day natural gas distribution facility in Ajaokuta, Kogi State. The gas city gate will supply natural gas to domestic LNG plants, CNG facilities and industries in the area. Additionally, NGML and A4E Energy have signed a 10-year gas sales and purchase agreement for 5 million standard cubic feet per day of natural gas to A4E Energy CNG operations. This partnership aligns with the Nigerian government's decade of gas program and the presidential CNG initiative. NGML, Nigeria's leading gas marketing and distribution company, is collaborating with A4E Energy, a domestic company focused on gas operations, to leverage Nigeria's abundant natural gas resources for industrial development and the benefit of its citizens. And finally, Larry Logan, the president of U.S. Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas on Monday, indicated that she expects the central bank to continue lowering interest rates and reducing its balance sheet. In a speech delivered at the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association annual meeting, Logan stated that a gradual decrease in the policy rate towards a more neutral level can help manage risks and achieve the Fed's goals. While acknowledging the economy's strength, she highlighted uncertainties surrounding the labor market and inflation. Logan's remarks come as market participants debate the Fed's ability to deliver the half percentage point worth of rate cuts projected in September. Recent job data has suggested a stronger than expected labor market, which could potentially limit the need for aggressive rate cuts. 
And that's a package on business news at this time. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetua Fasami Peter. The news continues shortly. Business news in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. Rivers United reclaimed top spot in the Nigeria Premier Football League after securing a narrow 1 0 victory away to Niger Tornadoes. More detail in sports with Onyinye Obara. Sports Update, brought to you by Corn Oil. Corn Oil, we go the extra mile. In the world of sport, newly elected president of the African Table Tennis Federation, Waid Eniton Oshodi, has emphasized the need for innovation to drive the commercial growth of African table tennis and enhance opportunities for players to earn a sustainable income from the sport. Speaking after the conclusion of the 2024 ITTF African Championship in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Oshudi highlighted the potential for African table tennis to strive commercially if strategic innovations are implemented. Table tennis is a, it's an enormous product in itself, but we now start to think in, we have to innovate to make it lucrative, to make it commercial. For people to earn a living, it's not enough to just play, you know, you think, everybody tells you they can play table tennis until they see our professional players. These are gifted athletes, you know, some of the most gifted athletes on the planet. And then when they see them, they keep coming back to see them. So we have to make that now a way of life that table tennis is a sport like basketball, like athletics, that you would pay good money to go and watch. The Nigerian Basketball Federation has announced the commencement dates for the long-awaited 2024 NBBF Men's Premier Basketball League season. Sixteen top teams will compete in both the Atlantic and the Savannah Conferences of the league. The Savannah Conference will take place in Joss, Plato State, from 25 October to 3rd of November 2024, while the Atlantic Conference will be held in the indoor sport hall of the Samuel Ugbemudia Stadium, Benin City, Edo State, during the same period. Defending champions Rivers Hoopers, who finished in third place at the last edition of the Basketball Africa League, headlines the Atlantic Conference. Other teams include Quara Falcons of Ilori, Ebu Comets of Lagos, Uluyole Warriors of Ibadan, among others. Rivers United has reclaimed top sport in the league after securing a narrow 1 0 victory away to the Baku Katangura Stadium in Mina against Niger Tornadoes, with Schaefer Jackson scoring a decisive goal. Finidi George sides are still unbeaten after eight matches, with six wins to the name. Meanwhile, Ikorodo City delivered an electrifying performance, overcoming Lobi Stars 4-2 in a thrilling encounter. The first half had ended 2-2, but Ikorodo restored their two goals cushion, thanks to two goals in three minutes from Solomon Alade and Rivio Ayamwere. With the result, Ikorodo City becomes the third team to secure four or more goals in the MPFL match this season and the first to achieve this feat at home. Finally, in the world of sport, the Confederation of African Football will announce its final decision on the Boch Libya Nigeria African Cup of Nations qualifying match on Wednesday. The two parties had until Sunday, October 19th, to submit their sides of the case. But according to the Libyan media outlet, the Libyan Football Federation may have asked that the first leg match that Libya lost in Uyo should be included in the investigation. The Libyan Federation submitted all documents it collected with a specialized lawyer assigned to supervise the Libyan file with the Confederation of African Football. Sports Update, brought to you by Corn Oil. Corn Oil, we go the extra mile. Up next is entertainment news. Entertainment news in association with Glow Unlimited. 
Tonight on Entertainment News, an investigative panel has found no evidence to support claims that Idris Okunaye, also known as Bob Risky, slept outside prison during his six-month sentence for abusing the Naira. Bob Risky served the sentence from April 12th to August 5th, 2024, and was transferred between multiple custodial centers in Lagos. However, the panel noted that his transfer to a maximum security facility as a first-time offender violated Nigerian Correctional Service regulations. The documentation for these transfers was improperly handled and backdated breaching protocol. While Bob Risky remained in custody, he enjoyed several privileges including a furnished single cell, access to a humidifier, a fridge, a TV, and frequent visits from friends and family. The panel recommended further investigation to determine if these privileges were financially motivated and influenced by corruption. It also emphasized the need for clear guidelines to prevent discriminatory treatment of inmates based on social economic status in the future. Ukrainian-born two-time Academy Award-nominated producer Alexander Rodniaski was sentenced in absentia to 8.5 years in prison by a Moscow court for his outspoken criticism of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Rodniaski, who had been a vocal anti-war advocate, was charged with spreading fakes about the military, a term used by Russian authorities for statements contradicting the official narrative of the war. He was also banned from posting on the internet for four years. Rodniaski, who fled Russia after being warned of a potential crackdown, labeled the case against him as political and accused Russian authorities of attempting to silence anti-war voices. Rodniaski, who previously lived and worked in Russia, producing acclaimed films such as Livathan and Loveless, declared that he does not recognize the court's authority and will continue to speak out against the war. He highlighted how the Kremlin suppression has targeted numerous Russian artists and civilians, stating that his Ukrainian nationality sets him apart. Despite the sentencing, Rodniaski Yasky vowed to persist in his activism, using media and film to share the truth about the war. That's all on Entertainment Tonight. Entertainment News in association with Glow Unlimited. Moving away from entertainment, let's take a look at what's trending as the hashtag and sauce take center stage. Following the facts that Nigerians paid tribute to heroes of the 2020 and sauce protest, marking four years down the line, a lot of Nigerians took to social media to express their concerns. Let's take a look at some tweets. At Uncle Ayo, Dear OK, it's been four years since you and I and million other youths resounded our voices against police brutality, one that had your life snuffed out by the Nigerian state. Your death was one amongst others that caused the pain that we can't heal from. Rest gentle. Hashtag NSAS. At Kate Enshore, there'll be no denial any longer that 201020 happened. The anthem didn't protect. The flag offered no solace. Continue to rest in power. At Aproko Doctor, 2010-2020, we'll never forget, we'll never forget that people were killed for standing up against injustice. At our favorite online doctor, we will never forget them, four years gone, four years in our hearts, four years on, but forever our heroes. At Fouls the Bad Guy, we will never forget the real heroes, some of the bravest Nigerians that have ever lived. We will never forget their ultimate sacrifice, for this day, four years ago, they redefine patriotism. May their souls rest in eternal peace. That's all on What's Trending. In a surprising twist of events, the Dangote Group has made a U-turn and announced that it will withdraw its 100 billion naira suit against the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority for granting import licenses to the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, NNPCL, Matrix Petroleum Services Limited, AA Reno Limited, and four other companies, despite local production of the petroleum products. The Dangote Group, in a statement late Monday, said the suit filed at the Federal High Court in Abuja on September 6, 2024 was an old issue and that events have overtaken this suit. And that is all 
On tonight, before we go, let's take another look at some of the major stories. Defense headquarters condemns call for military coup. President Bola Tinubu resumes duties after working vacation. Dangote Refinery makes you turn on import licenses of NNPCL, withdraws 100 billion Naira suit against NMDPRA. Cameroonian leader Paul Bia returns to Yaoundé after weeks abroad. You can catch up on all the latest updates. You can watch News Central live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and on YouTube. Many thanks for watching. Have a good night.